Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicheri, and former NFL scout and currently of Sports Info Solutions. Joined today by a very special guest, it's Neil Stratton of Inside the League. Now, for those of the listeners who don't know, Inside the League is exactly what it sounds like. It is a website devoted to giving all of the information, not just for the league, but for the people that make the league go, really the game behind the game. So Neil's got an interesting past. He's been on all sides of the football business, and now he hosts Inside the League, which is a service for everybody from agents, school officials, parents of athletes, scouts, certainly. Um, analytics folks, um, you name it, anybody who makes the business of football go, um, there's somebody who, who inside the league can use. And Neil has really interesting insight, and we're going to get into it right away with him, about modern scouting departments. So different departments around the league we know are all structured different ways. I certainly have experience with two of them that we can bring into this conversation. But Neil, more than almost anybody I can think of, is somebody who's tapped into really all 32 organizations and really 130 FBS teams and, and more than that, you know, as you go down to the lower levels. So he knows all the different ways that these can be constructed. And kind of from a meta perspective today, we're going to talk about the different scouting department models, what works, what doesn't work, the strengths and weaknesses. Neil, what's up? Matt, I hope I can uh, go half as well as the uh, introduction you gave me, man. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with myself now, I got to tell you. I, I was... <laughs> Not really uh, high on myself before I got here, but now I feel like I'm Superman. Um, I'm doing great. And um, as always, Matt, I'm, I'm honored. It seems like you and I trade off being guests on each other's platforms. I mean, for those of you who haven't um, checked it out yet, Matt does great on my YouTube page, the Inside the League YouTube page. He, has a, he was my speaker at one of my presentations. I think that was uh, two or three years ago. And then two years ago, he was part of a panel, which was incredible. Um, and if you're interested in what we're going to talk about today, you got to get on and check out our YouTube because we had three outstanding scouts who let it all hang out, left no secrets, talked about how much they made, talked about what was hard, talked about awesome war room stories. Um, Matt was a big time part of that. So for everyone who's listening to that, you got to check out that YouTube. That's, that sounds like a selfless promotion. It's not. It's really more of a promotion of Matt and what he offers and what he brings to the table. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you're mentioning. You've had me on at the Inside the League Combine Seminars, which, again, for people uh, trying to get to know the football business, looking to get into the football business, people already in looking to make other connections. Um, it's an assembly of all different types of people, everybody from from guys that train athletes that are that are going to the combine and, and have their training facilities all the way through. You see different uh, GMs that have spoken at these sorts of things in the past from from Phil Emery to Ray Farmer. Um, so Neil holds, hosts that every year. I was uh, lucky enough to speak there. Um, and yeah, definitely check that out on, on Neil's YouTube channel. All right, but let's get into it. We've got to talk. Um, we can get we can promote all the stuff towards the end of the show. But Let's talk right now. So I noticed you put out the, the blog post uh, a day or so ago where you kind of broke down some of the different things, some of the research that you were doing. I guess we should start off with what are the different possibilities? So, so kind of from a, from a top-down perspective, how many different ways can you uh, organize a scouting department? What, what does that look like? Well, you said top-down. That's, that's one way for sure. I think that's a way that has become – especially popular um, as New England has kind of dominated football over the last decade plus. Essentially, the New England model is we have one dominant thinker kind of at the top, and he's surrounded by two or three confidants. And then we have scouts who really are, for the most part, just asked to go out and get measurables, heights, weights, maybe get details about injuries, maybe learn about suspensions go out and get facts and come back with facts and then let the guy, the smart guy who's back at the, at the, you know, at the team central, whatever headquarters, make all the decisions. That's kind of how the Patriots have had a lot of success. We, we've seen the teams that are, that have GMs off the Patriots tree, the Falcons, the Lions, the Titans, move to that model in one shape or form. They may not have gone all the way, the way Belichick has, but they are moving in that direction. And I think we're seeing that trend as one that's become very popular across the league. 
Let's pause there for a second. So, so the Patriots model being the first model, I mean, you're talking about that really being more of a, a top heavy sort of model where you've got the, the decision makers very much separated. And usually I think of scouts as, as opinions, you give opinions and then you to the decision makers, you're saying it's not even opinions that their scouts are really giving. It's really just facts, totally limited to keep the opinions out of it. And the decision makers will, will just deal with the facts that they're given. So do they work with, a, with an NFS? Do they work with a Blesto as well? Or are they just doing all of that work themselves literally? Um, or are they duplicating it? Before I answer that question, Matt, do, do the listeners know what NFS and Blesto are? No, that, that's a, let's take a step back. National Football Scouting, NFS, the company that, that puts on the combine every year, um, amongst other things. Um, and Blesto, um, a similar company, these are scouting services. So a lot of the teams subscribe to these. It's kind of they pool their resources together and they get their preliminary information, mostly on junior prospects as they're coming up around their junior pro days so that they can start the whole process for the recruiting that year. Um, generally the concept there, right? Correct. And the Patriots are very famously one of the teams that don't use either service. And so that changes the way they do things. One of the ways they have to do things differently is they have to operate as if there is no, they don't have a cheat sheet, so to speak. So they have to send more scouts out to do more workouts, to, to ask more questions, to do these kind of things. They have to really scour the world. And that's, again, kind of more conducive to having a lot of people that maybe, again, aren't scouts, aren't opinion makers in the traditional sense. They're more of the information gatherers and that kind of thing. When I came, when ITL started in 02 and I started going to all-star game weigh-ins and seeing scouts, you could tell the scouts they, you know, they were probably about you know, 40 pounds overweight. They, had, they were bald. Uh, they were in the, la they're in the fourth quarter of their career because typically – uh, the guys that were hired were former college football coaches who knew an area very well, and they knew all the coaches in that area. They coached with them or coached against them. They were kind of experts on one region of the country, and so you bought them for that knowledge. Now, when you go to an all-star game, it's sometimes hard to tell which guys are the scouts and which guys are the players because very often they're hiring 21, 22, 23-year-olds who – just can't, walked off the field themselves. They are very athletic looking. That's kind of the mode now. That's kind of the direction everyone wants to go. It's really interesting because I reached out. Uh, I have one team that I kind of I'm very friendly with. They were looking to hire a scouting assistant. This is about a week ago. And one of the things guys said was, look, I, he said, well, I'm looking for a guy. I said, okay, well, I've got all these, these uh, personnel guys at colleges that I think would be perfect. He said, eh, I don't want him. I want a guy that I know is going to look the part and has played the game recently I was like okay and that's exactly I mean that's probably the description of most of the people that are getting hired today that's that's really encouraging they're hiring for guys that look the part as opposed to you know do the job well <laughs> that's why I didn't name the team and I'm not picking on them this is the uh the paradigm now and I'm not sure why you know in their defense Matt I'll say this and you know this there are a thousand people lining up for every job and I would say that of that thousand, probably 800 or 900 are qualified. How mm -hmm. you determine which one of those 900 you're going to pick, I don't know how to do it. I don't envy the people that are doing that, those hires because it isn't easy. There are so many people that want to work hard and have some smarts and play the game. I guess they can go to kind of esoteric reasons to do that. But anyway, um, I don't even know if I answered your question or not, Matt, but that's kind of how scouts are getting hired now. A lot of those guys, again, are kind of youngish. They're looked at for just to go out and hustle and get every fact they can, bring them back to the central base so that the decision makers can make decisions. Right. I almost picture, you know, going back to the, the Patriots conversation. Um, first of all, it makes sense, kind of, they're, they're looking for divergent thought. They don't want the NFS, the Blesto information. They want their guys to gather their own information. If you picture like a pyramid of the types of information that you're gathering as a scout, so there's, there's that factual information, there's that bottom level of the pyramid, you're, you know, all the kind of stuff that, that is really um, at the core level of who the player is. Then you have your opinions, kind of the level up above that, where you're starting to evaluate the players on their different traits, things like that. Uh, you might add in um, 
as you get higher and higher, different sorts of metrics that you might add in, different sorts of opinions that you take into the equation. And then finally, at the top of the pyramid, you have your decision makers where, where it's going there. You can picture the bottom level where a lot of teams are using just what does NFS say? What does Blesto say? And then trying to build up the pyramid from there. The Patriots are really trying to make sure that they're creating their own foundation all the way at the bottom level. So a lot of times the Patriots are one of those teams where they'll make a pick in the first or second round and people will be saying, oh, we didn't expect him to go there. And that's because I think the Kuipers and the, and the McShays of the world are really tapped into what NFS and Blesto are doing, you know, whether it's directly or it's through just the teams that those guys are talking to who are Blesto and NFS teams, they're getting much more of the consensus information than maybe even the Patriots are working with a lot of the time. And that's why you get that divergent thought. I think it's really interesting. And in terms of the way they've scouted, obviously nobody's had more success in the NFL than the Patriots over the last 20 years. But, um, in terms of drafts in particular, I don't think people think that the Patriots have stood out. You know, they, they drafted Tom Brady in the sixth round, and people will go on both sides of that, like, well, if they were so smart, why didn't they draft him in the first round? Um, obviously, there are market considerations there. But, you know, it, it's been interesting that they've done that. It, it almost sounds like the way that you put it, like they're just sending all these young guys out on the, and gathering all the information, and it's getting sent to Ernie Adams in a, in a dark room somewhere, and he just, like, Wizard of Odds it back out. And uh, there you go, uh, Belichick. This is this is the corner we're drafting this year, or, or uh, whatever else it is. Uh, and that's a gross oversimplification, Matt. And I don't mean to oversimplify, but I think there are certainly some nuggets to that. There, there's some an element of truth to that. That yes, that's kind of how they're doing it. You mentioned Ernie Adams, Nick Casario. Those guys are the ones that are kind of within that inner circle with Belichick that are making those brain trust kind of decisions. Um, at least that's been the model, I think, over the last 10 or 15 years. And you, you alluded to the fact they haven't aced the college draft. It's funny, and we can, you know, we, you and I could probably talk about this for six hours. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but I think the expertise in New England has been in their pro side, their pro scouting, how they've been able to bring in a Randy Moss. Um, you know, the list goes on of guys they brought in who kind of failed in other places that have really succeeded with them. Um, so, so yeah. here's what I'd say. I say acing the draft. I don't think there's a team right now that we can look at and we'd say they've aced the draft. They've drafted better than other teams have for X number of years. It's just something that's very hit or miss. It's very inconsistent. You have some years like like uh, the Saints had a couple years ago. You have like what, what the Colts did this past year, teams that, that were honored at, the, at that combine seminar that we talk about for what they've been able to accomplish. But you don't often see that happen two years in a row, and there are other reasons. You don't always have a, a high picks every year. There are different things. What the Patriots have done really well, though, is moving on from players a year early rather than a year late, um, doing these kind of trade swap type picks, getting guys um, like uh, the tackle they had last year, Dwayne Brown, who they sign as a free agent. And then when he leaves at the end of the year, they're going to get a third round pick in return for him next year. So uh, the sorts of things like that, that that set you up to be successful, even if you don't have uh, the highest hit rate on picks in the draft. We say that the draft's a 50-50 proposition. If you look around the league, it's not just a 50-50 proposition. For any given team over any meaningful period of time, it's a between 40% and 60% proposition. It is really packed in there. Yeah. There's, there aren't outlier teams with this sort of stuff. So, so it's fascinating. Okay, so let's, let's move, uh, I'd say, kind of a little bit, a team that, that is organized in a similar way to the Patriots, but definitely has some major differences. But in terms of kind of being bottom heavy, I don't think anybody outpaces the Browns based on your, your research there. They, you said they had 17 scouts and scouting assistants, which, which led the NFL. So well, that's a 2018 number, Matt, but yeah, they've got – a lot of people, and this kind of goes back to the Sashi Brown days, um, when they were trying to develop a bulletproof analytics model and really trying to go in a direction. And I think they wound up developing layers because the plan was to somehow filter all the information in a certain way. And I don't, I'm not privy to how they do their analytics or what have you, but I think that's probably why. I think if John Dorsey came in standing start and developed his own Scouting department, he probably doesn't have 17 guys to scout in the title, but that is what they have right now. Right. That makes sense to me. And so what people maybe don't realize is that Sashi's time goes back even, even before he was the GM. Back when I was there in, in 2013 under Mike Lombardi, Sashi was, was in the building 
um, and he was doing things that had to do with the analytics department. He just became more empowered after uh, the, the Ray Farmer era ended down there. But what we saw the way we had been building things even at that time was we had used kind of the Patriots way as the way that we set up our department. So I went to a New or from a New Orleans scouting department that was very kind of like old school typical. We'll get to those sorts of teams in a minute. But to the Browns where, as you mentioned, they, they were starting to build up in terms of the number of scouts. At that time, they were still pretty typical. But then Sashi really pumped that up in terms of the number of guys that they had there. But talking about things like gathering facts – and making sure that it's not just opinions like we were talking about with the Patriots. Those were all built in to the bedrock of what we were trying to do there. Um, we did work with uh, one of the two NFS or Blesto, um, but it's not that we were using that. We were still pursuing divergent thought and really trying to incorporate all of the opinions that we could get in there. But under Mike Lombardi, you didn't want to go to a meeting and come back with, this is what I think of this player. You had to come back and say, this is what I think of this player because – and you had to back it up with facts. And you had to be able to show on the film why you believed what you believed. Um, so in terms of, I think, like building up a lot of the structure of what they did, going back to when Sashi was there, I think a lot of it was probably similar to the Patriot structure. And to what you're saying, I really do wonder how much Dorsey has come in and said, we're going to reshuffle everything versus trying to fit in. I think he's, for the most part, it seems like he's tried to fit in with the analytics department as opposed to come in and, you know, clear everything out of the way and, and like you were saying, kind of start from scratch. It would look different from now if he had. You know, I, I think you're right. And if you know what that mix is, what that ratio is, I'd love to know what it is, Matt. I have no idea. I mean, I, I think he's on record as saying he didn't need a bunch of nerds when he first got to Cleveland, uh, kind of dismissing the analytics side of it. Um, but I think if you read, and I'm kind of reading tea leaves here, but I think if you look at what he's done, I think there has been some, some use of it. Um, I mean, one of the things that really has impressed me about the analytics side of things, and I think y'all were on target with this as well, I think Mayfield is one of the first real successes of the analytics era. I mean, he doesn't check all the boxes from a size standpoint and all those kind of things. But he had a, I thought he had a remarkable first year. And um, I think, again, don't quote me on this, but I think Analytics played into this in their selection of him. Now, with that said, I think John Dorsey is one of the top five talent evaluators in the league. I think Alonzo Highsmith is probably in that top five as well. He had both of those guys. I mean, obviously, both those guys were in the decision room. He had Scott McLuhan. You could you even argue he's one of the top five guys. I mean, they had an all-star team at the very top. They also had Elliot Wolf, who's not so bad either. So they had a lot of great guys making great decisions for him, and that played a lot. But, you know, I think analytics was part of it as well. I don't know exactly what it was. I don't know who to credit for all that. Um, they still have their big analytics guy in the building, and, and I think there's a reason for that. So I don't know how it all shook out and how the decisions were made, but it sure did work for them last year. They had a great draft. Yeah, I think there are a lot of ways that you can be critical of Jimmy Haslam, both football and non-football related for how, how things have gone with the Browns. But I do think the commitment to building up the analytics and making sure that, that you know, even as they've, they've moved forward with, uh, you know, the non-analytics hire, they brought in somebody who's, who's made use of it and hasn't just destroyed what was built because there were a lot of resources put into that. And you've got to give them credit for putting the resources there and building up and, and making the attempt um, I still think there are some things that they're doing that are really smart that seem to have obvious analytics sort of blueprints all over them. And then you also see some moves that, that really, from, a, from an analytics standpoint, you kind of scratch your head and you start to say, like, hey, this is, this is, a, this is not something that, that would have happened under the old regime. But we've seen some of those moves end up having gotten them more into win-now mode, which is, I think, ultimately where you want to be when you get that Baker Mayfield under under your belt you know and as much as i like to rail against people that that kind of believe in tanking because i hate tanking i i hate it in sports in general and i really hate it in football i don't think it works because i think you really have to build culture what i do believe in is is a rebuilding year i do believe that sometimes you've got to make what you can with okay we don't have a lot of resources saved up we've got to kind of orient them towards the future a little bit and deal with some raw times that's fair but I, it's hard to really make the argument somebody made the argument against me um, without Baker Mayfield, number one pick in the draft, and then a year before that, 
Miles Garrett, number one pick in the draft. It's hard to say that we feel so good about the Browns. So in that sense, the tanking did work. Um, so, um, yeah, you, you roll your eyes. So just for, for all the listeners to know, you roll your eyes when I say that because it's not, it's not 100% true. We don't feel really comfortable attributing those guys' success to the tanking. Um, at least on that level, I, I'll make that concession. Well, I wasn't – I didn't mean to dismiss you, Matt. My thing is I don't think they went out and said, you know what, we're going to pull our starters and we're going to have a lousy game plan so that we know we'll go 0-16. You know what I mean? I think there's a reason why they did poorly. Now, with that said, they made the most of the top picks. I mean, they, they did that right. And, and being successful in the first round, everyone thinks that's a lock. That's easy. Everyone aces the first round. Not at all true. And you can really set your franchise back when you start blowing those top 70, top 80 – top 100 picks um the browns didn't and they got those right and that's one reason why they're one of the real teams with momentum going into the 2019 season yep for sure so we talked about the patriots model very top heavy we talked about the browns model kind of kind of bottom heavy but at the end of the day probably a a similar sort of process in that there's so many opinions getting kind of washed out there that it comes back to those decision makers and certainly in both the patriots and the Browns side there's this mystery man there's ernie adams there's paul de podesta how much is that person playing a role in this sort of stuff and i would say what from my perspective what both of those teams have in common that they do well is good process to enable you to miss on picks and still have other guys in your building that can contribute Mm -hmm. Um, All right, let's flip around and let's go a little bit more traditional. Um, What are some of the examples of the more traditional scouting departments? I mentioned what I worked with uh, with the Saints. um, And now, you know, Mickey Loomis has his tentacles out with uh, Ryan Pace out in Chicago, likely a very similar type of structure in his department. What do you what do you make of the sort of uh, old school, typical philosophy? What does it look like and how does it work? Well, let's take the Bears because they have one of the more experienced scouting staffs out there. I think the Cowboys would be one who are extraordinarily experienced as well. Now they've had a couple of retirements and they've had to shake things up a bit, but I think they'll still come down kind of in the same area. The traditional model, and I think you're still seeing about half the teams that espouse this. They're looking for guys that are maybe a little bit more seasoned who have been doing this for a little while. They get to know a region pretty well. Um, They build on that. They come back. I think with opinions, Um, they want to tell, they're going to tell the GM who they feel can play, Um, not just facts, not just, you know, uh, measurables, what have you. They're going to, you know, they, again, and I don't know how far we want to go in this, but they go with their first ones. Then they have a national scout comes in and cross checks them. That's kind of set up in different ways. Right. So the general, you have, you know, say six different regions, maybe you divide it into, you have your area scouts, then you have maybe, two over-the-top scouts divide in the country in half, and then maybe one guy is at the director level looking at the top 100 players, the GM probably an even smaller list than that. Um, that's kind of, kind of being the, the, the general structure there, yeah. Right, right, yeah. And, and the Bears, again, the Bears and the Cowboys are teams that tend to have more experienced scouts. Not everyone goes in that direction, as we've discussed ad nauseum here, but they've got guys that are actually retiring from the team. In modern football, that's almost unheard of, that – an area guy might spend 20, 30 years uh, on the road just going out and getting, bringing back information, developing opinions, meeting people, building a network, all those kind of things. That was really common 10 to 15 years ago. Not so common anymore. But you know, I, I think you could argue that the, uh, the Cowboys and the Bears have both benefited from that. They've had success on the field, and I guess you could argue that maybe that's the direction more teams should go. Yeah, so you, you could kind of, you know, zig where others zag in the sense of everybody's just trying to hire young guys, then there should be some, you know, seasoned veterans on the street. You maybe pay a little bit more of a premium for them. The tricky part seems to be that if you're the evaluator, you have to actually be in, uh, the decision maker. You have to actually be interested in listening to these scouts. Um, it seems like if you don't want to actually listen to the people's opinions and you just want to make decisions on your own, you can hire a bunch of young guys and and do whatever. But um, in this case, you're, you're actually relying on these people's opinions. Do you throw the Colts and the Seahawks? I know those were two teams that you mentioned. Do you throw them in the same category as, as, as the Bears and, and Cowboys in that sense? Yeah, I do. Um, I think when I wrote about them in the blog, I had them as examples of teams where I think it's pretty integrated top to bottom. I, I think Again, there are a lot of teams now where the brain trust kind of makes the decisions and they don't 
expect as much from the scouts. But I think, especially in the, the case of Seattle, which, you know, we, which we're seeing Trent Kirchner get interviews, Scott Fitter get interviews, um, Dan Morgan is DPP, and he rose pretty quickly with the, with the Seahawks. They've become kind of a factory for GM candidates and I think that's because John Schneider does a good job of really training really leaning on their opinions really trusting them really doing all those things I think that's the direction that Chris Bowd is taking the Colts as well I think that that's a model that can really be beneficial to you the only obvious negative I guess is that you've always got to be hiring good people that you really can trust because teams are always coming for your guys and trying to elevate them and hire them as their own GMs. I guess that's something that the Patriots have faced over the last 10 years. But again, because they have that brain trust, because Belichick has no, isn't going anywhere, the team kind of remains the same. They remain successful. I, uh, I think that as you know, obviously taking nothing away from Schneider, taking nothing away from Ballard, they've got to be finding those talented guys because – they do lean on them. They do make them part of the process. They do trust them. So mm-hmm. they better have someone they can bring in and fill in there as they lose them to other teams. Yeah, I think any, in any sort of business, you know, you can look at this on the field. When you put your resources into developing the guys that are on your staff and working on those guys and improving them and allowing them to be really empowered in, in what's going on, um, all of a sudden, you know, when those guys leave you, it can really start to hurt. So I wonder if, if Belichick maybe over the last 20 years if philosophically he's felt like he's needed to go in, in this direction of, of kind of more young guys, just because these guys keep getting snatched out from under him. He, he loses all the people that he put all the work in developing all that stuff like that. Um, you know, he's not getting compensatory scouts <laughs> like he's getting players. Right. So uh, maybe there's something, there's something to that. Um, I definitely think when you look at all of those teams that we mentioned, those are, those are departments that seem to be doing things in a really rational way right now, um, not overly focused on, on just bringing in a whole bunch of young guys, still trying to empower the scouts. Um, and then like you're saying, you know, you see a guy like Ed Dodds move from, from Seattle to the Colts. He's a, he's a GM candidate on a lot of people's radars. Um, all these guys kind of swimming in, in not this necessarily the same circles, but, but kind of in this same pool of being the experienced kind of cream of the croppers who, who are trusted by different GMs. There's a certain level of, uh, of scouting that you reach when you're really trusted by the GMs, and that says something. Um, and it's an interesting difference as we talk about the difference between these different departments. How many guys that you really are going to trust and take their opinion are you surrounding yourself with versus how many people that you just look at as fact gatherers that you're not really, you, you know, you're only looking at on that level. That seems to me to be a big uh, kind of differentiator. The thing about this, Matt, I mean, I just touched on a few models. Um, There's so many others out there. Take the Saints, for example. I mean, they are a team that – when they brought in Jeff Ireland, um, he was a guy that I think a lot of people laughed at because he didn't have a lot of success in Miami. But the, the facts are he is an incredible evaluator of talent. And when you mesh with the kind of team that Sean Payton wants to build, and Payton has influence on the draft as well, um, I think Mickey kind of stays out of the way, and I don't mean to diminish his role in this, but you kind of have Ireland who's doing all the talent evaluation and Payton who's kind of telling him, Here's how we want to make things fit. That's worked really well for the Saints. Um, there are more models than just the ones that we have here. Um, you know, the Ravens are another team that kind of have a different way of going things. There's, that's what makes this also interesting, and that's why, you know, you and I could probably sit here and talk for six hours just about how teams differ slightly in their models, but how a lot of them have success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, we will take a quick break on that note. Um, we'll take a quick word about the SIS football rookie handbook and then we'll come back in with some more information on Neil and really get into to the background on, on what led him to start inside the league and what inside the league is all about. Hey everybody if you like hearing about all the different players in the NFL draft if you are a draft expert yourself and you're looking to learn more the SIS football rookie handbook is a must have for everybody at home it's the same thing that the teams are using you get your analytical breakdowns of all the different players in the in the draft here based on sports info solutions proprietary statistics and then you get the real NFL style scouting reports based on my time coming up with the Saints and with the Browns and learning how the scouting reports are really done 
on the NFL level and brought to you at home in the book. So if you're interested in what we have on the podcast, please support us. Check it out. The SIS Football Rookie Handbook. It's available at actasports.com, A-C-T-A sports.com, and it's available on Amazon. Check out the SIS Football Rookie Handbook, and thanks for supporting the podcast. All right, Neil, now that we've talked a little bit about NFL scouting department models, I want to ask you about inside the league and how it came about. But before that, I want to hear about the Neil, Neil Stratton origin story, which I think is pretty much inseparable from the genesis of inside the league. So who is Neil Stratton and how did you get involved in football in the first place? That's a question I get all the time, Matt. Um, and Matt, you may know you're very involved in scouting evaluation. I hold the distinction, I think in 1989, of being the worst player on the worst team in, in America, uh, U.S. I when I played at Navy uh, in 1989. So no one can take that away from me. I got a trophy and everything. I was not a good <laughs> player in college. Wait, they I gave, a, they gave a specific trophy to you? for? Yeah, for I, mean, I, I made the trophy up. It's kind of like a toilet roll, but whatever. It's got a very hallowed place in my trophy case. But anyway, um, I was an all-star in the locker room, but I wasn't so great when you got on the field. I love the game. I love being part of the game. Um, so anyway, I played at Navy as a walk-on. I was there for uh, two years. And then fast forward uh, a few years, and, and I moved to Houston in 97. When I moved here, I didn't know anybody. And so within the first week of being here, I met this girl, and she said, oh, hey, you got to meet my fiancé. He wants to be the next Mel Kuyper Jr. I didn't know anybody. I was just a guy in Houston. So I said, okay, why not? So for four years, we published a draft guide called Lone Star Football. And essentially what – Troy and I did for four years. He took the offense, I took the defense. We did four publications a year. And essentially for four years, we uh, traded opportunities to spend $2,000 publishing a guy that we would stack up in our garage. So we did that for, I guess, 98 to 01. And I started going to all these all-star games and meeting agents and meeting people. And this is about the time when the idea of sports business news was becoming something people could grasp and kind of realize what it was. Um, the Street Smith Sports Business Journal launched right around that time. And so I thought, well, hey, I'm meeting all these agents. I'm meeting all these people that are kind of in the game behind the game. Why don't I do something for them? So we launched in 02. And um, I thought we were going to swamp our servers out, man. I thought there's going to be so many people that were interested in this business and wanted to know what was going on and how it all worked and all those kind of things. And we launched in, on uh, Memorial Day of 02, and it's pretty much crickets. And so we kind of had to tune things up and change things around. And so for the first five years of ITL, from 02 to 07, we kind of had one foot in the NFL football business world and one foot kind of on the fan side. And so we just still did mock drafts. We still did rankings. We still did stuff like that. So, you know, I guess it was 06, I started working for an all-star game here in Houston called the in a juice all-star north south all-star classic and i did personnel for them on a volunteer basis it went well it was fun i had the time of my life got to make a lot of new contacts met people on the scouting side kind of strengthened my relationship with a lot of agents and so um came out of that stronger but having different ideas about it and what i needed to do so uh, that game went away so the summer of 07 i reached out to the owner of the hula bowl who at the time had a vacancy at as, as his personnel director. Long story short, after a few dominoes fell, I became the executive director of that game. And so I thought, yay, I'm going to work for the Hula Bowl, which at the time was the number three all-star game. And I'm going to do this for 20 or 30 years. Then I'm going to retire to Honolulu. And I'm going to have a, you know, a, a co coconut with a drink in one hand and a lay around my neck. And I'm that sounds pretty good. Everything's going to be awesome. You know, how, where do I go wrong? So that was July of 07 by January of 08, I came home from the game, and again, this is a whole other podcast, so I told you all the stories, but the game went out of business. So I came home and kind of licked my wounds and cried in my beer for a couple weeks, and my wife said, when you started this Inside the League thing, the idea was to develop a service for people in the football industry. Why don't you do that? And so I thought, you know what? That's probably not a bad idea. So we scrapped all the fan side stuff, and we focused solely on who's getting hired, who's getting fired. Um, who, what teams are doing it right? Which ones don't seem to be doing it as, as well? What about, you know, all the things that ITL kind of would become is what we became in 09. We started kind of looking at things. We started instituting newsletter series. And now we have a newsletter series. If you're a new agent who just got certified, 
We've got a newsletter series that's going to tell you all about how to do that. We have practice exams for people who are going to be agents. And so they can kind of figure out, you know, what the test is going to look like before they go to Washington, D.C. We have newsletter series for parents of players. so They can kind of learn what the NFL draft process looks like. If you follow us on Twitter, especially this time of year, you're getting a lot of tweets about what scout is being hired where and what scout is being fired here and what that means. And we compile all that in a big board and we follow all those, do all those kind of things. We have seminars at the combine every year and we bring in a speaker from the industry and he talks about inside football stuff. And now we, uh, as you alluded to earlier, Matt, we, we have a vote among all NFL active NFL scouts and they select the team that had the best draft. And so we will award that uh, to them at the combine and they'll come in. And we, you know, we've been fortunate to have Jeff Ireland from the Saints speak. He was our, the Saints were our inaugural winner um, in 17. We had Chris Ballard come in. He brought his entire staff, 30 odd people um, to be there. Um, he spoke as well uh, at, at our seminar. So we're going in a lot of different directions, but I guess the common thread in all this is we're doing a lot of stuff that I think most fans would find boring. Uh, we don't do stats. We don't do highlights. We don't, we don't trash anybody. Um, we like to talk about who's doing things well. We don't go in, and, but we don't, you know, we're not like a lot of these websites that love to just rip and tear and get on Twitter and say, hey, look how smart we are. That's not who we are. Well, that's because you're not a fan site. It's, this is really an, an industry site. And I mean, if you're the most informed fans, the most informed fans, we've seen them. There's no, nothing stopping them. A lot of people, I think, are interested in sports for gambling reasons. And I think that there's really interesting stuff that you can do if you take into account some of the things that you're thinking about. Not saying I've done that in any gambling on my own. I'm just saying that I think it would be interesting if somebody did. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but um, I, th I think that, that that's really so. So you took that pivot, you know, a little over 10 years ago, it sounds like you're saying, where you really went in that direction. Um, away from being a fan site, um, but still, you know, stuff like the Twitter, being able to see all the comings and goings of different scouts. There have been friends of mine that I've reached out to and sent text to because I've seen it come across on, on your account. Um, and I think for, for people that really want to be in tune with what's going on behind the scenes, certainly anybody in the agent business or anything along those lines, the different scouts for teams reading your stuff, I know. So I want to get into, though, um, what are the important things that you're working on these days? I know you're always cooking up different things in the lab. Are there any projects that, that are kind of new or exciting right now that, that really kind of get you going and, and, and excited about where it can head? For the first 17, 18 years, whatever, of ITL, we really focused on the agent world, and, and you've alluded to that. You know, when I, and when I launched this in 02, I think Jerry Maguire was on TBS twice a day, sometimes three times <laughs> Um, so everyone in the world had seen that movie that wants to see it. And it was really an exciting time and people, you know, kind of had that in their minds. I think that for lots of reasons that are beyond the scope of this podcast, that's changed. And it's a lot harder. Um, the, the kind of the middle class of agents have kind of gone away. And um, so the, that business has really changed. On the other hand, I think where there is a lot of growth and a lot of surge and a lot of interest is in representation of coaches. And that's kind of where we're trying to go right now. We're trying to work a lot more to identify who are the coaches are gonna be power five head coaches in five years? What about in 10 years? What about next year? Who are the guys that you don't know about right now because maybe they're just some recruiter. Maybe they're a GA that are really sharp, really talented, may be in the right place at the right time. Um, and again, for our, our purposes, who's representing them? How are they getting where they're getting? What do they need? We are trying to do, uh, we're developing, and I'm, I'm hoping that we didn't get to launch it this year, but I think we're going to try to do it next year. We're going to try to do a GM camp for director level scouts who maybe they haven't ever really been interviewed in the sense that they will be when they become a GM. They don't know how to work with the press. They don't know how to put a staff together. We're trying to develop that model. Um, identify sponsors, find a good central location. So, so that's a really good point, though. You bring up, you bring up kind of how do you train to become a GM. And looking back to the earlier conversation about all the different models around the league and the different ways to organize this, there really is no great training for how to become a GM because a GM is touching so many different aspects of the organization. Right. You can come up from the scouting ranks, but you can also come up like Mickey Loomis did, really be a cap guy, like you alluded to before, who's kind of an overseer, a 
a real manager in the truest sense of the word, where he's saying scouting, that's Jeff Ireland's job. Coaching, that's Sean Payton's job. I'm going to make sure that we bring these guys together, that we're communicating, that we're bringing in kind of the, the, the capology into the equation and, and that sort of the stuff. But, but at the end of the day, he's really a manager there, and that's what he does. And, and the, the dying breed, I think, is the, the expert scout who just became so good at scouting that he's the, the head of the whole operation now. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott McLuhan just got fired um, in New York. He was, he was one of those guys, kind of, I'm the best scout. Um, and uh, I think we've talked about this before in kind of being a Peter Principle type thing. Part of it is is getting that training. I think it's awesome that, that you're putting that together because I think if you are on the scouting side or on the analytics side or on the cap side, it can be really hard to understand how to manage people on those other sides and how to integrate them into your process because we, we looked at those lists. We went across all the different teams in the league, and we didn't find teams that are really doing it well just by having their scouts be scouts and nothing else. It doesn't seem like that works in 2019. You know, it's funny. When you think – when you ask a fan, well, who, who, who gets hired as GM? Typically, they're going to say, well, whoever the best scout is. And you're right. That's kind of how it used to be, Matt. But now, my gosh, there's so many things you've got to manage and so many things you have to do as a general manager. It is, there's a lot of integration there. And so, yeah, you're right. And, and we're hopeful that we can find that. One of the things I think that I kind of want to champion it inside the league is the people that are paying their dues, that are coming up, in a traditional sense, the people that are working their way up, not the people that kind of fly in um, because they're a part of the TV world or the entertainment world or whatever. And I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but I really respect the guys that are getting these interviews. Look at the people that are getting interviews in New York right now. Joe Douglas, Champ Kelly, um, Trey Brown, um, Scott Fitterer, all those guys are, you know, they work their way up. They start off as area scouts. They're, you know, they've, they've been, they've got, they may have some pro experience. They may have just college experience, whatever, but these guys, these guys are, they're the ones that I think should be in the pool. Sometimes the guys that get hired aren't in that pool. And that frustrates me because I want to see people, you know, become good at their craft and respect the craft and learn things and make mistakes, but get better. And then, and so I, I'm really excited to see what the Jets do. Um, I hope, I think, I think Joe Douglas is obviously a choice there, but I, I would like to see, I guess, more teams kind of go about things that way. And that's what we want to do. We want to help those people that have paid their dues, polish up a little bit so that they're ready when they get to go do those interviews. All right, let's change gears a little bit. Fun question. Neil, I'm making you commissioner for a year. So starting today and you will be commissioner of the NFL. We're going to return back on, on June 6th of 2020 What's changed? I, I, there's one thing that I really, it really drives me crazy, Matt, and um, this is probably stupid. But why is a Super Bowl on Sunday? I get it that everyone, that there's there Saturday, are Saturday, right? And there are things that are really important in the marketing of the game and of the league and what have you and all those things. But why in the world is it not on Saturday night? Why are people having to go to work the next day? Yeah, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I said just make Mondays a holiday. If you're not going to make Mondays a holiday, just move it to Saturday. That I seems mean, so elementary to me. <laughs> I don't know why it hasn't been done. I know why it hasn't been done. Because that Saturday is a major whining and dining time for the people that the, that the league is trying to sell to. And I understand that. But I think from a fan standpoint, and I think you've got to be pretty fan-centric, why not do that? That would be – I think that would be so elementary and so easy. The other thing I would do, and um, I think that you'll see this happen the next two or three years, I do agree with the Pro Bowl. I mean, I don't think the players want to play it anymore. It's essentially a, it's a glorified tat, touch football game now. I am, I mean, if you're going to play a game, play it all the way. I was really a big fan of when Major League Baseball a couple years ago made the home, you know, home field for the World Series was riding on the All-Star game. They did away with that pretty quickly. If you're not going to do that, if you're not going to make it high stakes and make it really mean something, get rid of it entirely. Just have a list of the guys that, okay, these guys, you know, you've got your all pro lit, you know, teams that are named, whatever you want to do. But I don't think the Pro Bowl really serves any purpose anymore. So those would be the two big changes I would make. 
I can't stand I, the Pro Bowl with the number of alternates that end up making the game. And because they actually play the game, we call those guys Pro Bowlers. But, like, really, we're talking about Mitch Trubisky here. I haven't seen it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're right. They're going six or seven deep at some of these positions just to get guys that will come and play. And it's, yeah. it's dumb, you know. So I just don't think it's, I don't think it's worth it anymore. It's interesting. I wonder if there's a way that they could make it into something that, that would be a real moneymaker for them um, while still being able to continue. It, it's hard to think about a way that they can actually make it into something that's positive. They've obviously tried a lot of different things. Going back to your early point about Super Bowl Saturday, I think that the NFL has gotten themselves in trouble a lot over the last eh, 30 years of we're in really good shape. We're doing things really strong. Certainly the last 20 years, things have been going really well. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So right. Super Bowl Sunday is the number one TV event in the U.S. every year, year after year. Why are we going to move that to Saturday? It's a risk. Whereas I think if, if you're thinking about things not in first place, you're always thinking about how you can get better and how you can get better. I think that the Patriots, every offseason, they think about how they can get better. If the Patriots just rested on Sunday's been working for us this well, we're going to keep going on with, with the schedule we've been doing. We're not going to try to get better. Then other people will pass you. And so I, I do think I would like to see the league think more in terms of how can we enhance this experience as opposed to how, you know, oh, wow, we're getting left behind. Then we have to react to it. It's how I think of the social media stuff with the NBA allowing everybody to do whatever GIFs they want. GIFs, I don't even know how you say that word. But the NFL, you know, is on lockdown as far as that goes. I think until that it gets you in trouble, there's no, there's no impetus to make a change. But then usually once you're making that change, it's probably too late, you know, if you waited until the point where you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, one, game, one thing that I think will happen also is uh, we're hearing more whispers this week about an 18-game regular season, a shortened preseason, these things being possibilities. Where do you stand on that? I'm a little bit of a contrarian, Matt. I think you probably know that about me. I don't. Oh yeah, I, that's why I like you. That's why. That's why you're on the pod, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an. Eight, I'm not a fan of the 18 games. Um, I think. I mean, again, I'm old school. I believe in evaluation. I'd like to see players really given a chance to make a team. I really like to see got young talent come in. That's exciting to me. I realized that they expanded uh, the um, practice squads to 10 uh, two or three years ago because they didn't want to have to, I guess, so they could have guys that got to work during the season and, and maybe could come up that way, more or less their AAA farm team. But I, I believe in the preseason. I believe that even though players now are professionals, they come to camp, they're already in shape, they don't need the four games to go from, you know, in beer shape to being in game shape by the time. But I do think that's where your players get to get the, – the, the, the next wave gets to get their film and get to learn the game and all those kind of things. And short of having a minor league, and I'm not in favor of a minor league, I, we'll talk about the XFL in a minute, but I'm not in favor of formal NFL minor league, but um, I think – that there is value in having the four preseason games. I know that drives season ticket uh, owners crazy, but I, I'm not an 18 game fan. I also don't like the fact, again, this is my get off, get off my lawn phase, but in 10 years, you know, the, the 5,000 yard um, barrier for passing is going to go to six that or, you know, maybe mm-hmm. not 6,000, but it's, that's going to be blown away. Thousand yards. People are going to say, oh, I got 1,000 yards. Over 18 games? So what? You know? Mm-hmm. But no one's ever going to make that point. No one's going to offer that perspective. And I think that matters. I mean, I'm a fan of the old – I mean, I'm a fan of Otto Graham. I'm a fan of, you know, Jim Brown. I'm a fan of all those guys. We can't compare those eras anymore. Maybe that's impossible anyway. But if we go to 18 games, it's almost like what they played is a completely different animal from what we're doing now. Um, you know, I'm not in favor of all the, the rules that make it almost impossible to play defense anymore. That's why we're seeing, you know, and again, I realize the era of the 50 to, to 49 game has become pretty commonplace. Again, and I know I'm sounding like an old man, but I think there's some art and some beauty in playing defense as well. So I guess for all those reasons, the 18 game season is not that exciting to me, which means I'll probably do it. <laughs> well, for me, I think eventually they'll make more money. I'd love to see an, an extra bye week if they went to the 18-game season. It would probably be 
a two-week preseason. I've also heard maybe you can do a three-week preseason by having a neutral site game thrown in there, which I think would be an interesting approach to take to kind of find a little bit of a happy medium. You're not punishing season ticket holders. Um, you're not having a four game, you're just going to the three game, but you're also not having the two game preseason. But you mentioned the XFL, you know, the AAF folds, which I'm interested in hearing your perspective on. And I, and I want to know what you think of where the XFL is going. But I, I think you're right to point out that, that that's not separate from the conversation. If we're talking about increasing or decreasing the amount of football that we have NFL style, that should certainly have some effect on the, the appetite for spring football. Yeah. Um, what do you make about that AAF folding and, and where do you see the XFL? I think there have been kind of the UFL and the USFL too, and there have been so many different leagues that have tried to play. I think if there's been one thing proven conclusively over the last 15 years, it's that the NFL already has an incredible minor league system and they don't pay one penny for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there is an appetite for quadruple A football essentially. Now, with that said, everyone who's – there are, I have probably a dozen friends who are, have a, a position in the XFL. I'm rooting for them. I, as a guy who believes in giving young players chances and, and as a fan of the game, I want the XFL to succeed. I hope I'm dead wrong. I just don't see it. It's really hard. Um, I think there is a limit to anyone's love of a sport, and I, and I recognize – that the um, AAF's opening week was better. They did better, I think, in ratings than a – was it a playoff? It wasn't a playoff game. It was an NBA game that was very – you know, they, they did better than NBA. Um, that says a lot about um, the people's appetite for football. I get that. But I still think at the end of the day, selling sponsorships, selling tickets, doing all those – selling commercials, doing all those things is a lot harder than finding – another 53 guys per team that want to play football. The football part of it is, you know, relatively speaking, easy. It's getting the money for it. And that's why all these leagues have failed. I don't think the XFL has a long-term future, again, unless the NFL decides they want to start cutting checks and they haven't shown an ap appetite to do that in the last, you know, 10 years. So I hope that the XFL hangs around. I think it's got two good years, but I don't know beyond that. Now there's – if I can say one more thing, Matt, the wild card in all this is the, the, lab, the potential labor stoppage in 2020. If that happens and Vince McMahon decides, I'm going to open my check, checkbook and I'm going to try to bring in some players that are maybe at the tail end of their, of their careers and they see maybe there's not going to be football next year, so maybe they'll go play XFL, maybe, that's, maybe that happens. Uh, maybe they get to hang around a little bit longer, but I think long term – there is not an appetite for that extra league. I think that's satisfied by the NFL and by college football. It sounds like it's good for the, you know, the NFL PA if, uh, if the XFL is there as kind of a threat while that, while that CBA negoti negotiation is going on. And you said that, that expires when? The end of this coming season? It'll be technically the new league year is when it will end. So I guess the March, the February, uh, early yeah. March. Is when that, so, there won't be any free agency. Um, you know, we went through this 10 years ago. It wasn't fun. Uh, I'm hoping that we don't have to go through it again, but it doesn't look really promising right now. Interesting. I, I think it'll be interesting to see with, with the XFL there on the other side. I've already heard they could be making a play for uh, Trevor Lawrence after his sophomore year of college, you know, getting him in over there. Um, I see you shaking your head. Why, why the head shaking? Well, I think that that would be a nice short-term move for Trevor Lawrence. I mean, if he's willing to play for one year, but it, obviously the NFL is the long-term play there. Uh, the money that, again, unless McMahon hands him a piece of uh, the, the WWE, I can't imagine that he would look, you know, try to trade that one year and then maybe sign, you know, kind of go the Herschel Walker, Doug Flutie route. I don't think that'd be wise and I don't think he'll do it. It, it may be tempting, but ultimately – you know, I just think it's smarter for him to look look long term, and I think that's probably what he'll do. Interesting. So, you think it might harm his his long term NFL future if he if he took that that short term XFL? I, I mean, I don't think it makes him necessarily a, a lesser player or anything, but I think it might delay it potentially his his right. chance to go to the NFL. I mean, there were cer certainly a lot of awesome, incredible players. You know, Walker, Steve Young, 
um, Reggie White that played in the USFL, but um, and, and ultimately it didn't affect their NFL careers. But I don't know why he would risk take a risk on that again with such a short term reward short short term reward when he could just hang around for another year or two and go to the NFL and kind of go the more conventional route. I, you can't argue with the long-term success of the NFL, as you alluded to, they're doing nothing but winning, Matt, no matter what they do, it seems like everything they do just turns to gold. Well, we're seeing in the, in the NBA now with the one and dones, some guys electing to play overseas. We saw one guy take a contract to just train from a shoe company um, as opposed to playing college basketball. So I do think we are coming to a reckoning with that, with that free league that, that goes on there. It'd be really interesting to see how these kind of all work in conjunction with one another. I don't think I necessarily thought before 10 minutes ago of the preseason potentially being contracted and the regular season expanded as having to do with the XFL, as having to do with college football. But I think, as you point out, those are really all uh, inextricably linked. Um, all right, one more thing before we get out of here. What's happening beside behind the scenes in the football world that not enough people are realizing or talking about right now? What's one thing that's on your radar that we don't know? Well, I think it's something that you know, Matt. I, I, the way that teams hire is fascinating to me and when I, and, I, and, and I'm talking about scouting departments and and GMs and all those kind of things it's interesting to me to follow all this stuff because if you understand how teams are building their organizations who they're looking for where they're trying to come from all those kind of things you kind of can see who's going to be successful long term um, a lot of it's incredibly frustrating to me that there are still teams, however, that tend to hire based on loyalty to whoever's already in power there. I think it's still too commonplace in the NFL that team people aren't hired on merit as much as loyalty to the right person. Um, there is a scout scouting assistant that was hired this, this term in the last 30 days because my – my understanding is because he went to the same private school as the owner. That's absurd. Okay. That's crazy. That's not merit based. And I know that when, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, when I was kind of a kid coming out of college, I would love to have had a chance to compete on my own merits on maybe working for an NFL team. I think that more often than not, that's not how things happen. Now, once people get in, then they have to prove themselves and, and they're, you know, they, they get to stay long-term based on that. But I think all too often people are hired into the game based on relationships, where they went to school, who they knew. Maybe they played with the son of the right person. And I realize nepotism is – you're never going to get past that, especially in the really powerful, successful organizations. But I would like to see that curb and I'd like to see more merit-based hiring, I guess. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that one. I think uh, truer words haven't been spoken. Neil, thank you so much for coming on. How can the people get a hold of you, find your work, and what you're doing at Inside the League? Well, if you're not in the, in the business, but you're interested in the kind of things that Matt and I have been talking about, go to my blog. It's called SucceedInFootball.com. It's a WordPress site. It's totally free. You can read about what we're doing. We do a lot of things. You can also register for our Friday wrap. There will always be a link in the Succeed in Football blog where you can do that. It comes out on Friday. It's a quick kind of review of what happened on the football business side, college and pro every week comes out Fridays at 7.30 PM Eastern time. You can also follow us on Twitter, obviously, uh, just to kind of get a feel for who we are, what we do, what we write about, what kind of content we're providing. Um, that's what we do. You can find, obviously the homepage is inside the league.com. We charge 30 bucks a month. If you're really into the kind of things Matt and I've been talking about, probably worth a try. You're never um, obligated more than 30 days at a time. So you can come in, see if it's your bag or not. If not, and go off with, uh, with our compliments. But you may really get into it. You may really find some things you like there. Yeah, and I think it may not be obvious, but there are always ways just from, from following Neil and the different outlets that he has, including that Twitter handle um, and the blog. You can learn a lot about things that are going on around the league and maybe learn some different perspective instead of hearing, you know, the same people on first take yell about whatever everybody's been yelling about, you know, for, for at the time being. Um, you can look into, oh, I didn't realize this guy had a relationship with this guy that they had worked together 10 years ago in this job. And, and that's how that dot might connect. Um, love looking at that kind of stuff. And, and nobody's more tapped in than you. So thank you so much. And on that note, we will sign off. 
Thank you to our producer, Justin Stein, and thank you to the listeners. Uh, we couldn't do it without you, and we appreciate you. Um, please help us spread the word about the Off the Charts Football Podcast by recommending us to your football-loving friends, especially if you know people who are in the football business or are looking to get into the football business. Please shoot them a text. Tweet at them. Do what you need to do to get them to check out this conversation with Neil. And as always, you can tweet at sportsinfo underscore SIS. You can tweet at me directly at Matt Mano, M-A-T-T-M-A-N-O. And you can find Neil at Inside the League, spelled exactly like it sounds. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next week. Back with Aaron. Aaron.